environmental yeah. engineering. These are courses that that make our students, our young people, knowledgeable of the effect of plastics on our environment and how we can provide mitigation measures. We have to attract our young people, help them to think creative, creatively in terms of using plastic-free materials. So the college can work in the sense that we're making awareness. Awareness is very important and getting our young people involved. So this year, the environmental science students in Unit 1 or Year 1, um, they were doing research on um, sand dunes and we looked at four different areas. The Keys Beach was one of the, um, the sites that were chosen yeah. in addition to North and South Friars Bay and also as well as Frigate Bay. And so we realized that if we could use paper products or minimize waste, that would be the best way to go. So training them to be advocates for the environment is obviously the best thing that we could do. Another advantage to having our students, faculty engage in research here at the college is that it will disseminates to the wider community. They take it home to their families and we learn about um, the different policies that will assist us in environment, solving our environmental issues. At a higher level we can lead the way by instituting policies to, to combat plastic pollution on campus and perhaps this, this, this new um, strategy might influence the higher policy makers in government to come on board you know, so CFBC can certainly lead the way in that regard. So the most important thing is for us to, to use plastic-free products, such as plant-based materials to make plates and, and cups and so forth. This is the number one means of eliminating plastic pollution uh, and having the consumer refuse to take plastics. That's very important as well. And so it is important for us to understand the impact of our actions and so I am imploring the general population that if you can't reuse it, then refuse it. But I think the, the solution lies eventually with the children. I think they're the ones who, who are going to mold the, the protection of the environment moving forward. So I think we need to educate them and create some high levels of awareness in those schools now at this level. But the key is, um to act upon the knowledge that we do have now. And I think that's an ethical responsibility to act upon what we do know now. And there are many solutions uh, for the uptake. We don't have to wait necessarily on more research and all that stuff. And if we do not act now, we're actually discounting the future in economic terms. And that simply means that if we wait... Good evening and welcome to this plastic-free July panel discussion. It's brought to you under the theme, the elimination of single-use plastics, our dream and our greatest challenge. This is presented to you by the St. Kitts Sustainable Destination Council. I am Leighton Narain with the Clarence Fitzroy Bryant College, and I'm pleased to be the moderator of this panel discussion. I will now introduce to you our panelists. Starting from my far left, is Ms. Visia Woods. Ms. Visia Woods holds a bachelor's degree in environmental science and a master's degree in biosafety. She joined the Department of Environment in 2013 as the biosafety project coordinator and later became the biosafety officer in 2016 with the responsibility of ensuring that safety measures are put in place regarding the safety and handling of genetically modified organisms in the Federation. Ms. Visio Woods, welcome. Next is to my immediate left, Mrs. Daniel Taylor Williams. She is the Assistant Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism. She worked in the Ministry of Tourism over 20 years. She's also the chair of the St. Kitts Sustainable Destination Council. Next is Ms. Jamela Christopher. She is the senior manager of the Solid Waste Management. She's also a committee member of POP. She will mention more about that to you. She is also a member of the BCRC, that is the Basel Conventional, Conventional Regional Center in Trinidad. Then next we have 
Mr. Dexter Henry, also known as Ras Judah Farai. He's the owner of Eitel Creations, a vegan restaurant. His philosophy is no farm, no food. I like that. He's also an organic farmer. So that is our panel. I want to draw attention or special attention and recognition and thank you to our sponsors. The First Federal Credit Union, the title sponsor of the Plastic Repurposing Competition, of which you will hear more about during the break. We also have sponsors, Farmer Care and the Development Bank. Our, our panelists will touch on issues and impacts, national policy and protocols, activities or responses to combat plastic pollution, and opportunities for enhancement of livelihoods with consideration of social, economic, and environmental sustainability benefits in relation to their respective profession. But first, let me say that plastics belong to a category of environmental contaminants called synthetic organics. Two other categories are heavy metals and organic chemicals. Synthetic organics are manufactured using petroleum base that are very toxic to environmental health, affecting flora and fauna, that is people, wildlife, and plants. Plastic enters the food chain in which we are a part. It is very insidious as they act with enzymes in our bodies causing damage to our immune system and ailments such as cancer, birth defects, brain damage, and other chronic illnesses. Each of us can play a role in this plastics-free July. Now I will call upon each panelist to say their name again and bring you brief remarks. Ms. Vicia Woods. Okay, thank you, Dr. Narin, and good evening to the listening and viewing audience. Um, as Dr. Narin said, my name is Vicia Woods, and I'm the biosafety officer in the Department of Environment. Now, a part of the department's mandate is to conserve and protect the environment, and we all know that uh, plastics are detrimental to the environment. So I'm just here to this evening to share a bit of the impacts of plastics on the environment and what the Department of Environment is trying to do to combat these um, impacts of plastics. Now, we are a society that is highly dependent on plastics, whether they are reusable plastics or single-use plastics. But this evening, I'm going to speak to single-use plastics. And when I speak about single-use plastics, I am referring to those plastics that were meant to be discarded. Um, immediately after use. So for instance, it's, uh, your plastic straws, um, styrofoam containers, food wrappers, and so forth. So these, as I mentioned, uh, can be harmful to human health when improperly disposed of. And this is because um, these, these plastics bring, introduce toxic, toxins into the environment and they eventually end up in our food chain. Now, speaking to styrene, this is the material that is used to make styrofoam containers and this material has been listed by the World Health Organization as a possible carcinogenic and what that means is that it has the possi possibility to cause cancer in humans. So um, plastics are non-biodegradable non and that means that they, are, they do not break down in the environment so they can last hundreds of years in the environment but they do however break apart into smaller pieces and when these smaller pieces break into even smaller, tiny pieces, these are known as microplastics. And these microplastics um, find their way into our waterways and eventually into our oceans. And when they enter in our oceans, they are eaten and they're consumed by the marine life and the marine animal. And of course, we in turn eat these marine animals and then so thus we digest these plastics. So this is very detrimental not only to the environment and not only to the ocean environment, but they're also detrimental to the health of humans. So um, the, Department of the Department of Environment 
has seen this as a major issue. And I'm just going to touch on two steps that the department has taken and will be taking to combat this issue. And um, firstly is the National Coastal Cleanup. Now, the National Coastal Cleanup is something that the environment has um, hosted over the past 15 years. And uh, this, is, uh, this involves the, co the cleanup of the coastlines. In St. Kitts, it is hosted by the Department of Environment, and in Nevis, it is hosted by the Nevis Historic and Conservation Society. Um, another step we have taken is to submit a proposal to the honorable members of cabinet to basically ban the use of single-use plastics. Um, I'm going to stop here for now, and I'll get into the meat of that later on in the discussion. Mrs. Dineel Taylor Williams. Dineel. This evening I'll be representing both the Ministry of Tourism and also the Sustainable Destination Council, which is a multi agency partnership responsible for sustainable destination management in St. Kitts. Eleanor Roosevelt once said that the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Tonight we are talking about dreams and challenges. And I'm also referring to our sustainable tourism journey. According to the United Nations World Tourism Organization, sustainable tourism is defined as tourism that takes into full account its current and future economic, social, and environmental impacts, addressing the needs of the visitors, the industry, the environment, and host communities. Now, as we know, the Caribbean is more dependent on tourism than any other region in the world, and think it is no exception. Tourism is an economic, an important economic driver of our dual island nation. In 2019, over one quarter or approximately US $546 million of the St. Kitts and Nevis GDP came from travel and tourism. Additionally, tourism supports about 25% or one in every four um, persons in our country's workforce. Now, according to a survey shared on hospitalitynet.org, two thirds or 66% of travelers are motivated to travel to experience nature and beautiful scenery. And as we know, when visitors come to the Caribbean, one of their primary aspirations is to experience our island's pristine coastlines and thriving natural environments. Diving, snorkeling, boating, beach going, and other forms of marine tourism are a particularly important source of revenue for St. Kitts and other Caribbean destinations. Reef-associated tourism, it is said, generates $7.9 billion in expenditures per year in the Caribbean and Belize. And an average of four, which is an average of $473,000 per square kilometer. Now, plastic pollution is a major concern for all tourism destinations but it is a particularly pressing issue for the islands of the Caribbean that rely heavily on our coastal resources and also because we lack sufficient recycling systems. As we know, single-use plastics often end up littering the beaches, coastal waters, and coral reefs that tourists come to the Caribbean to experience. The presence of pollution and litter therefore minimize the attractiveness of the destination and degrade the visitor experience. If destinations are dirty and polluted, then it will likely deter visitors from coming here. In a 2017 study undertaken in Brazil, it was discovered that more than 85% of beach goers would actually avoid going to a beach that had more than 15 litter items per square meter, which would then cause local tourism income to decrease by up to 39.1%. And as if that is not bad enough, we now have the ease of social media sharing. As a result, it is becoming easier and more common for tourists 
to post videos and photos of their travels. In addition to sharing their favorite memories, travelers are warning others about their negative experiences and they're using social media to raise awareness of waste issues by posting images of beaches covered in trash, divers swimming through a sea of plastic bags and marine animals entangled in debris. As visitors broadcast the pollution they encounter, it can result in long-term harm to the destination's reputation and diminish its tourism value. It is important to recognize that when we talk about sustainable destination management or sustainable tourism, we are not only talking about reducing resource consumption and, produ and protecting the environment. We are also talking about sociocultural and economic impacts of sustainability as well. And in order for sustainable destination management to succeed, all stakeholders must take action and participate. Similarly, all stakeholders must do their part to encourage more sustainable plastic use. And as tourism recovers and life begins to return to the, a new normal, we are hoping that new protocols for the tourism industry would connect hygiene with sustainability to ensure that measures introduced provide substantial health benefits and minimize harmful effects on the environment. We at the St. Kitts Sustainable Destination Council see the need to prioritize plastic reduction now more than ever. And during Plastic for July and beyond, the SDC will continue to facilitate awareness, action, and collaboration around this important issue. In conclusion, I ask that you know that travelers are increasingly seeking out destinations and businesses that demonstrate a commitment to sustainability in general. It is also now fair to say that a majority of travelers from the Caribbean's largest outbound markets are seeking out sustainable businesses, destinations, and experiences. And I'll stay here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vinyl. Now we turn to Ms. Jamela Christopher. Good night. I am Jamila Christopher. I am a human being. Senior manager at the Solid Waste Management Corporation. I deal with a lot of the awareness. Most of you would have heard me on, the, on our weekly radio show, Talking Trash. Now, Solid Waste is solely responsible for the collection and the disposal of all waste within Thinkit. We basically come to the end of this train where the problem is already here and we have to deal with this issue, how it affects our country and how it affects our people. We have actually seen a, 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 about a 5% increase on an annual basis in regards, to, in regards to the increase in waste. Now, when it comes to the collection, that is okay. However, the disposal of the waste has caused a tremendous issue. With only basically two options we have right now, that is to the landfill, we have to have a new cell or we have to burn it. Now, this is, both of these are two problems. Currently, our landfill is approaching, is almost filled. That implies that we have to move into another landfill. It carries a cost of about $20 million. However, the problem is still arise because that is not a correct solution. The other problem, the other, is, the other solution that we have is to incinerate the plastic. We are on the eve of conversations in regards to waste to energy. And just before the COVID-19 hit, we, are, we were in conversations with a number of investors on how we can go forward with it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it as we go along. Judah Farai. Yes, blessings. My name is Dexter Henry. Everybody know me as Judah Farai. Owner 
at Ital Creation, um, vegan, vegetarian kitchen. Um, at Ital Creation, um, we have organic farm, we're sustainable, and we're eco-friendly. A few years ago, we decided that we're going to stop using foam and plastic. The reason why, because of what we're into, we're into organic, we're into natural things. And we know the damage of plastic, and we know the damage of foam, what it can cause to people's body. And we really want to make the change. And we know that we have to make a step as soon as we can. So we started it. Uh, we started also to bring them in, bring in compostable stuff. But it was, a, it was an issue for us with, um, with um, shipping because of, they're not duty free. So they become more expensive. And I think this is a, is a big problem still, still for even me as a small business person bringing these compostable stuff that's still going back to the earth and still have to pay um, duty free. But um, I have Rams bringing them in and you have Sun Island bringing them in and that's where I purchase my stuff then for now, right? But I see, I see plastic still as a big, big problem and I see it just like sin, honestly. I see that it had to get rid of, just like how sin had to get rid of. So we have to renew our mind in order to understand what the damage is, just because we know what sin is and what plastic is, is similar, what the damage is it can cause, so we can renew our mind to get that change. If we can't renew our mind and understand the damage, we will never change, because 94% of the things that we have used around our house, house our, our community, are made from plastic. So it's a big challenge, and you really have to start with us. Just like what I said, I, 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 I categorize it with sin, honestly, and that is my grounds. Um, just look how we have to get rid of sin, we have to get rid of plastic. So um, I'm going to stay here for now until we continue. Yeah. Thank you very much, Blessings. Tudor Farai. All right, we will take a short break and come back to take your questions so that we will go into the next segment with a question and answer session. Now, please also come back with solutions offer up some solutions and ideas, and that sort of thing. You can call the following numbers, or any one of the following numbers. 466-2666. That is 466-2666. We also have 662-8674. That is 662-8674. Or you can call 767-4765. I repeat, 767-4765. And for overseas calls, you can call 1-239-645-4500. I repeat, 1-239-645-4500. We'll see you after the break. Hi everyone, good day. My name is Vincia Collins from Vincia's Artistry. Today, I will be making a pair of earrings from plastic. So let's just get right into it. This is the pattern. It actually was cut from Clorox bottle. I will be painting it with polish, use the polish and I will be doing a tie-dye sort of effect. It's my own unique way of painting on plastic. Be sure to use your gloves when you're dealing with polish. But you can always use acetone or polish remover to get the stains off your finger going to give this a few minutes or two to dry and then we will do the other side. Let's turn on the other side and we're going to do the same just as we do the front side. Look at that. Isn't that unique? After this has dried, we will then enter air wire. Our earrings has fully dried so we're now going to put in the air wire. So we're going to use the tip in and we're just going to pierce the earrings 
put both of them together preferably and we're just gonna pierce right through okay we're gonna put in the rings and we're gonna put in the ear wire now for the second one And this is the final completion of the plastic earrings. This is what it looks like. This is a finger tie-dye sort of painting. We're going to complement our earrings by adding a bangle. This bangle was made from just an ordinary piece of plastic tube with the same tie-dye finger painting effect. This is what it looks like. You're just gonna set a little piece of um, wooden stick. We're just gonna insert it into the end piece. And we're just gonna add the other end. We're going to enhance our bangle by just adding some gold rings. We're gonna start by just putting put in the gold rings in the joint area. Isn't this unique? Just look at this. This is the finished look of the earrings and the bangle. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. The month of July is plastic free. So I am encouraging you to reduce the use of single use plastic. Okay, welcome back. And thank you for calling in your questions. Um, let me also say that we are on Zoom and Facebook. So if you look us up, you can also send in your questions through those media. Uh, the first question here is, who are some of the members of the SDC? And how do you become a member? Or how do you become involved? Steinil Taylor. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, is a multi-agency group. Um, which is made up of several members within the private and public sectors, as well as civil society. So we have membership from the Department of Environment here represented. Uh, we also have membership from the St. Christopher National Trust, CYEN, which is the Caribbean Youth Environmental Network. We have membership from Culture. We also have the St. Sea Turtle Monitoring Network among our many members, as well as Skelec and Water Services Department. How does one become a member? It's very easy. What we require of all our members, and we've been encouraging persons from various agencies because we want it to be truly multi-sectoral, um, multi-agency, sorry. Um, we encourage persons to sign on to become members. They have to commit to spending at least three hours per month working on projects with the Destination Council. Um, they're also encouraged to participate in our Destination Guardian training. We are currently having one taking place right now. It started today and it continues until Wednesday. We are persons who are not involved directly in tourism are uh, brought up to a level playing field in terms of their understandings of the issues related to sustainable tourism, which leads to sustainable de um, destination management as well. So we have that training. All members must go through that training so that when we are discussing issues, we have an understanding, a common understanding of what the issues are that relate to their agency or their group or organization as it relates to destination management. Uh, so, um, Daniel, we have, um, we'll have a busy night. We have more questions for you, <laughs> if you don't mm -hmm. mind. 
Uh, please tell us what are some of the achievements of the SDC so far. Uh, we've done quite a few things, and, and not, it's not specifically at the Ministry of Tourism, but our members are involved in different projects. For example, some years ago, the Department of Maritime Affairs was a member of the Sustainable Destination Council, and through the representatives' um, involvement in the training that we had at the time, the Sustainable Tourism professionals training, we saw the influence of that training in the development of the yachting policy for St. Kitts and Nevis, which speaks to a sustainable luxury yachting um, product in St. Kitts. It's actually spelled out in that policy. Members have also been involved in the, the development of the marine managed area, which is the two mile radius around St. Kitts and Nevis, including Monkey Shoals. We've also had our members who uh, have incorporated in their activities things that they would have learned as members of the Destination Council. The persons who are involved in the tourism education program, that the training is influencing what is being done in that training um, for the students who are in the pilot project for the tourism education program put on by the Ministry of Tourism in collaboration with the Ministry of Education. We have also, and I'm, I tend to leave this for last, but just last year, just over a year ago, the St. Kitts Sustainable Destination Council won the World Travel and Tourism Council's Tourism for Tomorrow Destination Stewardship Award. And it is because of all these different activities that we've been involved in over the seven years, sorry, six years that we've been in existence, this year will make seven years, that we were able to win that award, which is a global recognition of all the work that is being done. And I can remember just last year, as we were producing the information to submit the nomination, we did not realize, and I remember speaking with my peers, and we started laughing because I said, I never realized that we had done so many things until I was required to list all the things that had been done by the Destination Council or that were influenced by the Destination Council. And how could I forget St. Kitts and Nevis Restaurant Week that came out of the Destination Council. It's now in its sixth year. The concept for having a St. Kitts and Nevis Restaurant Week came out of the Sustainable Destination Council. The Heart of St. Kitts Foundation and Sustainability Charter also came out of the St. Kitts um, Sustainable Destination Council. And in case you're wondering, the Heart of St. Kitts Foundation is a travel philanthropy program that was organized in response to an assessment that was done on our destination and where it was found that we did not have any means in place for visitors to our destination to give back to the destination. And we know that we have lost out quite a few times of visitors who wanted to give to the destination, having had such a great experience here. And then when they tried to find who they can make the donation to, there was nothing formal in place. And that is why we created the Heart of St. Kitts Foundation. And we use the heart speaking to heart issues because if you love St. Kitts, you're going to want to give back to St. Kitts. We also created the Heart of St. Kitts Sustainability Charter, where we encourage local tourism businesses to tell their sustainability story. Sign on to the charter. Um, spell out exactly what it is you're doing in, in your business or what you plan to do in your business to ensure the sustainability of your business. And that is basically what the Heart of St. Kitts Sustainability Charter is all about. And those are just a few of the things that the Sustainable Destination Council would have been involved in, aside from Plastic for July, which is now in its fourth year. Thank you, Diane Um We have a great spread of questions here, excellent questions. Uh, I will call, and this one looks like for, it's for Visia. Uh, Visia, um, where, as, where are we as a country 
with passing laws and regulations to reduce or ban single-use plastics. Okay, thank you, Dr. Narin. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the Department of Environment had submitted a proposal to um, the members of cabinet to um, impose a ban on plastics. Now, this ban will take place in um, a three-phase three approach, approach over a period of five years. Now, a uh, phased approach means that um, the ban won't be an immediate and abrupt ban. Um, this will take place in phases, um, like for instance, um, the first phase will include a public and awareness outreach. So we want to get the public's idea of um, the issue, if they are aware that um, plastics pose an issue to the environment. And if they, are, if they feel that there is something that needs to be done about plastics in the environment. And also within that year, along with the public awareness and education, we will um, have a, um, a ban on the importation. So in this way, um, suppliers would be able to use whatever they have in stock, uh, but they would no longer be allowed to import. And then later on, there would be um, a ban on the, the, um, the sales and distribution of plastics. Now, although the legislation has not been passed as yet, the Department of Environment has taken it, taken it upon themselves to start with the public awareness and outreach. So, Late last year into this year, we conducted a survey um, where in various times um, just to get the, the public's um, reaction and get their attention to, to this issue that we, are trying to, that we are trying to raise. Now, one of, the first pro one of the first items that we are seeking to ban is plastic straws because plastic straws, as small as they may be, they cause, um, they cause a, signif a significant threat to especially the marine life. So, and we've seen that uh, plastic straws, um, even without this ban, um, we've seen restaurants and bars already moving towards the paper straws. So that is a good initiative on the, pri on the private sector. And we've also seen persons purchasing their own uh, metal straws. And these are, these straws, sorry, the stainless steel straws. And these straws can be carried with you for those persons who feel that they absolutely need a straw. They can be carried with you, and um, you have a, a cleaner to clean it after every use. So that's where we are right now. Um, we had submitted the, the, the proposal to cabinet late last year, but you know these things take time. But in the meantime, we are conducting, we are continuing to conduct the public awareness and outreach just to get the public's idea on, on what we are trying to do and just to get them informed. Uh, thank you, Vicia. Um, now, I see another question here which you have partly answered, so I might as well give this one to you. Uh, uh, this one says, uh, you are calling on persons to limit or stop using single-use plastics, but what alternatives are being proposed? Okay, like, sorry, like I mentioned, um, the stainless steel straws is one way, and um, We've seen restaurants also now moving away from the styrofoam containers to the cardboard containers. Um, that the, 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 the containers that are made from cardboard. And this is an initiative on the private sector's part, even without um, the ban being imposed. Um, we've also, at the, at the Department of the Environment, we've also handed out, we continue to hand out um, reusable shopping bags, because this we feel is a big problem also in the supermarkets where we get so many bags for just a few amount of items. So we've handed out um, reusable shopping bags. We've also handed out um, reusable utensils. And we're urge when we hand them out, we're urging persons, even if you want to purchase food, that you reject um, the, the, uten the plastic utensils and always take with you the, the reusable um, utensils that we have given you. Yeah, so, so we already have some alternatives, that's what you're saying. Uh, so that's great, it's a good start and there's miles to go. Uh, I see another question here. Um, I think I'll give this one to Ms. Jamela Christopher. Um, this one here, asks, what are some of the Caribbean islands doing to reduce the use of single-use plastics? How do we measure up to that? 
Well, currently, there are, as of January 1st, about seven Caribbean islands have totally banned the use of single-use plastic bags. As my co-host mentioned, we are not at that stage. However, we are not at that stage. However, internally, she has also mentioned a number of companies are doing their part. Now, the objective of solid waste, or uh, the best position that solid waste is in, is that there is a decrease of waste that comes to the landfill and the type of waste that comes to the landfill. As the young lady mentioned, persons are being advocated to use reusable bags. I have observed restaurants using paper, paper cups, and paper other paper utensils. Now, this is going to assist us. All right. Um, seems like this other question seems like the one that you can also answer, uh, Jamela. Are there good, affordable options? to plastics? If so, give us some examples. Well, <laughs> when you use a plastic container, it is a, a, it's a daily purchase. If you purchase a reusable mug, if you purchase a reusable bag, that is something that you can have for a longer lifespan. And so I would say that the reusable cups, um, the metal cups, the metal straws are better options than the one-one plastics. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we can turn to uh, one for the business community. And I know our friend Judah Farai is already green in terms of his mode of production, uh, having a farm and preparing idle foods. Now, um, this question here is, um, say, have there been any challenges with going green? And this means reducing the single-use plastics, the use of single-use plastics uh, for your business. Yeah, it's been a lot of challenges going green, but um, for us, we know it's a must, so we make the difference. So this is an example of a difference here that we do. As the lady, our sister here, was talking about the stainless steel straws, the stainless steel straws, we have the, the forks and spoon, um, burger box, um, food trays, you can get nine, nine inch plates, and soup bowl, and many other things. Um, you can use glass cups. So, you know, we already started it because we know it's a necessity. Well, you, you, answered, you already answered the question by the, by the next caller here because the question is, what can be done to make it easier for your business to reduce single-use plastics? And I see you have some excellent displays already. Yeah. And so if you'd like to add anything to that, yeah, please I'll, go ahead. Also, at our business, we encourage people even to bring their own containers, and they even get $5 off of the food. So you can even push it a calabash, uh, bring your own container, um, so you can reuse it all the time. So that's less used in the plastic as well, you know? All right, um, thank you very much. Um, I think this one here, I have a lot of questions here. <laughs> um, maybe Diane, you'll take this one. Uh, does the SDC have any intentions to lobby the government to ban single-use plastics in the Federation? If so, how long do you think that process may take? Um, the SDC does not specifically um, plan to um, as you say, I have um, any intention to lobby government directly with respect to the banning of plastics. As you would have heard from the Department of Environment, which is also a member of the Destination Council, they've already written to the Cabinet of Ministers about the issue of plastics. What our main thing is, is bringing awareness to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis about the problem of plastic and how we need to change. And one of the things we realize as we, we consider the sustainable development goals, the banning of plastics is inevitable. 
It is how we approach the banning of plastics and how we prepare our people. We have heard stories, we talked about just a while ago, how many countries would have banned plastics. What we don't often hear about is the repercussions or the antagonism that took place as a result of the banning and the way it was done by those countries. And so we have decided to assist in creating awareness of the need to change, to help where we can in educating people. I remember one country, um, one regional country, when they banned plastic um, food containers, the vendors or the merchants were up in arms because they did not even have a chance to look at an alternative to prepare themselves to use the alternatives, what would be the best alternatives. And I can remember us laughing at the issue because, yes, it is okay, everybody tells you you can get the um, cardboard box, but how do you put gravy in a cardboard box? And, and we know our people tend to like, especially if you're having something like um, corn meal, ball of corn, fungi as we call it, with, um, people tend to put a lot of gravy with that. How do you put that in a cardboard box? And so the people, there was an outcry from the merchants about the fact that they did not have the opportunity to prepare themselves properly. We are saying in SDC, we are educating people, we are looking at um, where people, businesses can source these items, um, the getting the best possible prices. We know, that, for example, that some um, companies in the region supply these items in bulk, which would be a reduction in terms of import duties as opposed to if they were being imported from the United States or any place outside of CARICOM. So those are some of the things that we have been doing in the Sustainable Destination Council. We've been sharing that information. We've been educating people on the harmful um, impacts of plastic. And we are not speaking only of the environmental issues. We are talking about real issues in terms of our people, our livelihoods, the health of people um, who have been using plastics and especially styrofoam for carrying food and for heating food in styrofoam. Um, we are sharing information about the dangers because sometimes we hear people saying it costs so much to purchase the plastic alternative. But I tell people, how do you weigh your life as opposed to the additional cost on the plastic alternative? What is the value of your life to you? Because if you continue to use these things which are cheaper and lighter, in the end, in the long run, the cost is going to be even greater than the cost would have been had you bought the plastic alternative. So that is what our function is. And if we are going to be lobbying government, it, it will be indirectly where we educate the people, the electorate, about the dangers of plastic and the need for us to change. And if that's the way it gets um, the government to know take a, pay attention, and I know they've been paying attention because I know I've heard minister, former Minister of Environment speaking to the issue in last budget address for 2019, but we want our people to be on board, not that it is a top-down um, implementation of this ban, but all of us top-down and bottom-up at the same time. Well, well yeah, I, th that's very interesting because um Responsibility lies with the community, of course. Exactly. We are the users, and we are the producers of waste as well. Right. Uh, but certainly, we, sometimes we need that support. Now, um, as you know, I, I represent uh, the CFTC, and no pressure, but uh, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. How are you doing, the SDC doing, with um, that awareness uh, program in schools? As you know, we like to build sustainability uh, from an intergenerational and intragenerational perspective. Can you please um, give us a sense of that? That is approach from different angles. One, we have our tourism education program. Now all our tourism education officers are from the Ministry of Tourism and inculcated into the curriculum for the tourism education program, we have 
recycling and repurposing projects for the children when we teach them about the need to uh, reduce the use of single-use plastics. We also have another approach in that members of the SDC have gone out to schools and made presentations to students about the problem with, with plastic. We tend to do it usually around Plastic Free July, but outside of that, if we are invited by a school or if there's a special activity taking place at a school, we make ourselves available and we go and we make presentations because we believe um, that the children are the future. And if we're talking about sustainable destination management, it is taking into consideration your current situation in preparation for your future situation. And the children will be our future situation. So we must involve them um, at every step of the way. We also have had students from CFBC sit on the St. Kitts Sustainable Destination Council. And this year, in the evening, our Plastic Free July, we are specifically targeting youth with some of our activities because we know how important they are to the sustainability of our destination. Well, thank you very much, Dianeel. Um, now, before we go um, on an, not a short break, um, I'll repeat the numbers to call in. You can find us on Zoom or Facebook. Uh, we are open for calls. And uh, the numbers here again are 466-2666. That is 466-2666. The other number is 662 8674 662 8674 or you can call 767 4765 767 4765 there's also an international number that's 1 239 645 4500 1 239 Six four five four five zero zero. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back.
Well, welcome back. Um, we had a busy break with lots of questions. <laughs> But uh, we'll go right into them. We are happy to take these questions. Very informative. Uh, it will at least reveal many of the things and, and clarify many of the things that we need to know. Um, the first one here is uh, for solid waste. Um, and of course, is Ms. Christopher. Um, what are we doing to ensure and encourage supermarkets to reduce bags? the use of bags. Well, currently we are not very involved in how the supermarkets distribute their bags. Unfortunately, we come to the end of the spectrum in regards to the bags. The waste is already there, and so the generation of so much waste, we now have to deal with the problem of how the waste is disposed of. The problem we have with the supermarkets uh, in regards to solid waste is there is a lot of illegal dumping. A lot of the supermarkets them hire outside persons who do not always come to the landfill to dispose of their waste and so we end up with a lot of illegal dumping and as my co-host mentioned, these people go all down to the sea and this type of waste gets into um, the marines. And so in regards to that, we advocate that the supermarkets and any other businesses, once you have waste to dispose, you have a conversation with solid waste to ensure that the waste that you are generating comes directly to the landfill so we can do our part in properly disposing the landfill in, in our realms. Um. Is a solid waste. Um, so where are we with uh, legislatively implementing measures? Well, our laws are about 20 years old, and we, we iterate them every time we go onto the talk shows. We kind of tackle illegal dumping. Now, again, the problem is when persons do not dispose of their garbage appropriately, they end up in places that they are not meant to be. Plastic do not decompose. A lot of persons have taken this task of burying their plastics in the mountain, at the back of the yard, and so we are not even aware of where this, where this plastic is. We are saying that to please bring this type of waste to the landfill, and we are going to do what we have to do to dispose of this properly. I, I, you, you mentioned illegal dumping there already, but um, I just want to read this question to you or ask this question so that the caller yeah. gets a good response on this as well, or a direct response. Uh, what legislative measures are SWMC hoping to implement in order to drastically eliminate dumping, which okay. oftentimes includes single-use plastics, which then ends up in our guts, then coastal waters, and ultimately negatively affect marine life and destroys coral reefs? Okay, we function on the Solid Waste Act, and that allows us to ticket persons, uh, culprits who are guilty of illegally dumping the waste. The minimum fine is actually $500, and then there is a removal order. So not only do we fine you, you have to remove that waste uh, at your expense. We do not have any new laws at hand. However, we look forward to the ban that we, I heard my colleagues speak, speak about, and so hopefully that will help to decrease the amount of waste that is coming to our landfill. All right. Um, OK, now for you had a busy time here uh, <laughs> with solid waste. Now, um, let's get one here for, um, for, for Vicia. What has the government done to help sensitize citizens on the dangers of single-use plastics. Okay, thank you, Dr. Narin. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the Department of Environment has embarked on um, initiating a survey, and in this survey, we outline um, the harmful effects of plastics. As I mentioned earlier, um, we we showed you try to show the public how they are detrimental to the health of the environment how they are detrimental to human health and even um life um in the oceans um what we have what we have tried to do over the years was uh, as i mentioned earlier also the 
coastal cleanup. Um, the coastal cleanup is where we take uh, um, use the initiative to um, sensitize those who are volunteering and even the, the wider public. And uh, in this, in volunteering for the coastal cleanup, they get first hand, uh, um, a first hand experience to see how the plastics that um, that are improperly disposed of end up uh, in the environment and in the oceans. So this is one way in which our persons are sensitized as to the effects of plastics. Now I just have a little bit of information on on the, the, the coastal cleanup. Um, the coastal cleanup, as I mentioned, it takes place in St. Kitts and, uh, and on Nevis. And the coastal cleanup is a part of an international coastal cleanup and this is an annual event. It, is, um, it was initiated many years ago by the Ocean Conservancy, and this is actually a non-profit ocean advocacy group. And I'll, I can just share a bit of information as to last year's findings um, in St. Kitts and on Nevis. Now, in St. Kitts, and on, both on St. Kitts and on Nevis, um, plastic bottles and plastic bottle caps were the two highest um, highest amount items um, found. In St. Kitts, when the beach cleanup, the coastal cleanup was conducted, beverage bottles amounted to 1,341 bottles in St. Kitts, and on Nevis, 2,285 bottles. And with regards to the bottle caps, is 1,252 bottle caps found on Nevis, and uh, in St. Kitts, I'm sorry, and in Nevis, 814. So these are some numbers that we really need to sit and think about. These were um, trash, plastics found on the beach and just one day in the entire year. So we just need to sit and, one, and think about the um, these, these, these items that were found. And then we also have to think about those that were not found because they had made their way into the oceans already. So this is, through this, we try to um, sensitize persons by seeing firsthand what the trash can do to the environment. And it's not just about aesthetics, and it's also about the health of the environment and humans. Thank you, Vicia. Now we have another one for uh, SWMC. And this question is, how do we dispose of plastic currently? Jamila. Unfortunately, plastic has become a very big problem. Currently, we, on our landfill, we are burying um, the plastic. As someone would have mentioned, plastic do not decompose for over a thousand years, and I think this lifespan that we would, we're going to have that problem solved. We are currently looking into a waste to energy option. Up until about maybe a few months ago, we are at the table and we are listening conversation on how best we can approach this and how best it is best to benefit not only solid waste, but the country on a, on, a, on a whole. So the option right now, we are burying it, but hopefully we move into a waste to energy. There's a number of projects that is being discussed and hopefully before the end of the year, we can come to the public with at least some sort of a solution. All right, thank you, Jamela. Um, I have one here for, um, I think this one could go to Dineal, Ministry of Tourism. Um, when will the video screenings advertised for Plastic Free July be shown, and what are the names? Plastic Ocean is a great one to be shown on ZIZ. Okay, um, video screenings are scheduled to start on Saturday. The first um, documentary is called Plastic Alarm, and that was done by a young man. I think he's less than 13 years old, and it targets a young audience. Um, so we're hoping to have that one shown this Saturday on ZIZ television. And every Saturday following, we are going to have another documentary being shown one of them is uh, The Plastic Problem. That's the longest um, documentary we'll be showing this year. We've already shown A Plastic Ocean. That was done um, two years ago. We, we, we showed Plastic Ocean. We had it shown at various locations around the island. We even took it to Nevis. 
And I would like to point out that that's one of the things that we are doing with the Plastic Free July um, campaign. We are partnered with the Ministry of Tourism on Nevis to do some of the activities that we have for this year's Plastic Free July. The video screening is also another option. However, as you can appreciate, for us to have the documentaries broadcast, broadcasted, there's a cost. And this year, um, sponsorship, which it, it is understandable, is uh, few and far between. And so that is one of the challenges we have in terms of the, the budget to be able to bring some of these um, documentaries that we really would want to share with the general public. However, if there's anyone listening and they're willing to co-sponsor with us, we can also look at that possibility so that these um, important documentaries can be shared with the general public. I can remember distinctly when I looked at Plastic Ocean. Now, I was only uh, made aware of the BPA free because you go around and you see bottles saying BPA free. But it, it, as a result of looking at that film, I learned that there were other chemicals that can be found in plastic that can be just as detrimental as BPA. So yes, you might become comfortable and say, well, it doesn't have in BPA, and so I'm fine. But lest we fool ourselves, there are other chemicals that we need to be mindful of, especially when we are heating or freezing some of these plastics. And I found that, and the feedback that we got from persons who would have viewed these documentaries was very encouraging because everybody who looked at them said they learned something new. And we did a survey, and we do surveys each year. We are right now finalizing the survey for this year. We do surveys each year after our activities, and we ask people, did you learn anything new as a result of the activity in which you participated? And for the showing or the screening of Plastic Ocean, the response was positive, um, and we are happy because people said that as a result of that, they were going to make changes in the, the way they dealt with plastic. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we have one now for small business. So I think that um, Judah or I would be, this would be a good one for you. Um, uh, how does uh, this reduction of single-use plastics affect small businesses who sell local juices, who make jams and local treats like sugar cakes, et cetera? Well, as I said, um, plastic is very hard to get rid of because 99% of the thing that we use, um, we use plastic. So we have to really reorganize our mind and really find a lot of ways. Um, I think we can even wrap these for small business. We can wrap them in snack, put them in crates, and people can just, you know, choose them. Um, you know, because plastic, we, we, we wrap all with snacks in plastics. Everything we use is plastic. So, as I said, it had to get rid of. So we have to win your mind, look for other solutions um, so it can be more easier for us. Um, put them in containers. Um, you don't have to be plastic. Put them in papers, you know. That's what you do sometimes, put them in papers. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, Judah Farai. Um, yeah. I guess I'm not sure who, this, who might take this one, but let me read it first. Uh, when will biodegradable options be duty-free to import if these options are to be competitive with styrofoam and plastics, they need to be priced competitively? Who, uh, uh, Jamel, do you want to take that one? Or maybe Daini? Okay. Okay. I cannot say definitively when there will be a change in terms of um, offering incentives for persons who would want to import biodegradable containers. And we still have to be careful when we hear the term biodegradable because plastic is biodegradable. It's just that it takes over 100 years um, to biodegrade. And so we have to be mindful of that when we're talking about get getting incentives for um, materials that are biodegradable. That being said, uh, we have been working, and I know the Department of Environment, 
would have been involved because we've had discussions with them in terms of not only um, just banning plastics, but getting government to offer incentives to persons for using plastic alternatives. And as you can appreciate, that would require some discussion because there are duties involved, taxes, which is where government would gain revenue. And so we'd have to look at what we, we are going to be losing and what we would have to put in place. I mean, we, we know, for example, there might be less impact on our health system if people start using the plastic alternatives, but that would be in the long term. So we, government has to sit and find that balance. When we give up that revenue that we would have gotten for using these items, um, what else would we put in place? Or as someone would have suggested to us, the duties that we are now imposing on plastic alternatives, perhaps we could turn it around because the plastics are usually cheaper. So whatever um, duties would have been applicable to um, plastic alternatives, you know, put that on plastics as a disincentive and reduce the duties. However, that would require discussions with the Ministry of Trade. And I think that people need to understand that it is not just a one ministry or one department discussion. It requires all persons coming to the table because if I take action over here at tourism and start saying certain things, how does this impact another agency? And so it would be best for all of us to come to the table because, for example, Solid Waste spoke about the fact that they're at the end of the, the chain which relate in relation to plastics. But we all know, and we've experienced it, they have had to bury plastics, but we know sometimes there, there's combustion at the landfill, which leads to problems for persons with respiratory prop, um, challenges, health challenges. And so we can't just look at it that um, it's one person. So we'd have to bring solid waste to the table. How, how would this impact you if we were able to reduce these things um, and reduce your cost? Because I, I can imagine there would be some cost when there's some fire at the landfill, um, creating other issues for not only persons in the vicinity, but even their workers who would be um, even closer to what is happening. And so I would think that everybody needs to come to the table and we can make a decision that works in the best interest of the persons in general. Okay, um, thank you, Diane. It seems like you have a special talent because there is another question that came in and you answered the question already, and that had to do with incentives offered by government, at least what, you know, what the outlook on that is. But um, Jamila, would you like to add to that, please? Like. Like Daniel said, all of the services um, are integrated. No one service stands, stands alone because where there's a ban on plastic, of course, it will decrease the amount of plastic that comes to our landfill. And she didn't mention that it has become very costly to maintain the problems. When plastic do break down, they release a number of gases that contribute to a number of fire. You would have recalled sometime earlier last year we had a huge fire and that, had, that, that was very costly. Again, even if we are to dispose of the plastic, it costs us. So the best objective is to decrease the amount of plastic that comes to our landfill and it will surely decrease our cost and our problem. Our landfill is we are running out of space. We are already capped to one cell and the lifespan for that cell was actually almost 30 years. In under 20 years, that landfill was already filled. I don't know, we are increasing in population. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good, but we are increasing in population and we are generating a lot more waste. Our second, land, our second cell is on the verge of being capped. That just leaves us with two options, moving to another landfill that we have the expense of, or hopefully the waste of energy. But even the waste of energy comes with problem because of course when you are burning plastic, it releases a number of gases. As a farmer nurse, I can say there's a lot of implications when it comes to burning plastic. And so the best option is to really to decrease the amount of plastic that comes to our landfill. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamila. Now, <laughs> these other questions here seems like for tourism. Um, Tiny, seem, the, the, the talent that you have for seeing into the future, the callers have picked up on that because they would like to know where does the SDCDC themselves in the next 10 years? Um, we haven't even gone as far as the next 10 years. We have been looking at where we are, we are going to be in the next five years. We just completed a visioning exercise for the Sustainable Destination Council. And out of that, we came up with an action plan. And one of the top projects out of that action plan is the Plastic Be Gone campaign. So we will continue to advocate for the elimination or reduction of single-use plastics. We are also hoping to get the issue of sustainable destination management integrated into our communities and to get our communities more involved in tourism development and planning. We want um, persons to understand that sustainable destination management is not about doing things for the visitors, but according to the tagline of the Sustainable Destination Council, whatever we are doing has to be good for us and then it becomes better for all. So we want people to integrate that into whatever projects they are doing and so hopefully by the next 10 years because unlike many other countries and even one country nearby which started their destination council as a result of us creating a, our destination council they've gone ahead of us and they have legislated their destination council our destination council is still a voluntary group and we are hoping that by 10 years from now that whoever is responsible at that point, it will be fully integrated, it will be legislated, and will get the recognition and the opportunities for inte integration into the work of the various agencies of government um, so that we have partnerships, as is being done throughout the world in even larger organizations than ours. All right, thank you, Lionel. Um, this one is for environment, uh, Visio. Uh, the question is, small vendors will be heavily impacted by a plastic ban. Are those persons being considered? Okay, thank you, Dr. Nareen. Um, yes, most definitely, um, we know that the small businesses will feel um, this ban um, heaviest. So yes, consideration has been given to them. Um, as I mentioned before, the ban will take play, place in a, a staged approach. And this is why um, the ban on these uh, like plastic plates, plastic cups, plastic carriers would happen later down in the future. So um, this is a way in which to give the, the small businesses and small business owners and local man, even local manufacturers, it will give them some time to identify um, plastic, plastic alternatives. Um, it is also hoped that they would have, uh, there would be um, some kind of duty-free concession and so forth um, for these, these business owners that want to bring in these um, plastics alternatives. Thank you. Thank you, Vicia. Um, now, this one here is that caller says that we hear the term sustainable destination management. But what does that mean? What do citizens need to know to keep that in mind? So I think, Daniel, that is a good one for you. OK. Um, sustainable destination management is about managing our resources um, in a manner that ensures our current um, population benefits and um, future generations benefit. So we look not only at environmental issues, because very often people hear the term sustainable destination management and they immediately begin to think of environmental issues. I can't begin to tell you the amount of calls I've gotten when I start mentioning the Sustainable Destination Council. People start telling me about issues to do with um, 
in the environment, who litter, and stuff like that. And people don't often take into consideration the other elements of sustainable destination management, which focus on livelihoods as well as our people. And people are an integral part of any destination. Um, so sustainable destination management is about looking at all of these and bringing people together in partnership for sustainable, for sustainable destination management to work. All of these things have to um, be balanced. You cannot have more attention being paid to environmental issues than you are paying to people issues or even um, profit or livelihood issues. There must be a balance between all three. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we have one for solid waste management. It says here, Admirals takes plastics to be recycled. Are there any plans to form a partnership with Admirals to reduce plastic waste going to the dump? Jamelo? We do. The word dump kind of, so we, have, we have a landfill, so. <laughs> um, the word kind of, okay. Admirals is operating independently. And honestly, Solid Waste is open-minded to any person that has a plan in regards to proper recycling methods. We have to have a discussion, but we have had a number of persons approaching us. However, we have not um, tackled it down, but Admirals, Admirals operates independently. I must say though, Solid Waste is now embarking on the second, the third stage of their plan in regards to recycling. I think persons would have recalled in 2018, we had our national cleanup. Now this meant that we went around and really gave the community a chance to properly dispose of all of their waste. We just came off of the bin distribution project, which is stage two. Now we are going into hopefully within the next two to three years waste characterization. Now what this is about is that we are separating the waste. Currently, the waste that comes to solid waste is bulk waste. Nothing is separated, everything is together. And with the distribution of the new bins then we are hoping to separate the plastic. I think persons would have traveled, you would see in the Americas that you separate your plastics and so it is easy to recycle. And the fourth stage is our recycling plan. And so even though we are not operating with animals, we welcome the gesture. We welcome any organization that comes with a full plan that is beneficial to solid waste and the community. And we are currently working on our own options in regards to recycling plastic. Thank you, Jamela. Uh, now, I think we already touched on this one here, but we can do some more clarification. Um, the question is, what is the Ministry of Tourism and the Department of Environment doing to actively ensure and phase out single-use plastics in St. Kitts and Nevis? Uh, maybe Daniel first, and then we get uh, Vicia to add to that. This is one of the things we, we um, as indicated, we signed on to the global um, Plastic Free July uh, movement four years ago. And so we continue to bring awareness. We have various activities uh, related to um, this. We've had, we have and we've had um, Sink It's a Nevis. Um, those are some of the things we've done. We've done beach cleanups as well. And like um, Department of Environment, unlike them, we, only, we don't do it once per year. We do it at least twice. But we also partner with other organizations through the Heart of St. Kitts Foundation. We partner with other organizations who do beach cleanups. And whenever we do our beach cleanups, we do like them in that we separate the waste um, plastics. We send those to admirals and the other ways we send to the landfill. So those are some of the things, and each time we have a beach cleanup, there's an education session before we begin any cleaning. All right, uh, VC, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, um, 
currently, because we do not have um, a legislation in place as yet, there's not much we can do um, with regards to the phasing out of, of um, single-use plastics. Um, what we can do and what we have been doing, however, is um, basically educating and sensitizing the public that you know this ban is will be upon us shortly. Um, so this is this is something that we have done and we are continuing to do. Um, another thing we have been doing is, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the the coastal cleanup. We make persons aware of this and we try to get the the private sectors involved as well. Um, over the past years. Um, Christoph Haber has been a major sponsor for the, the internet for the coastal for the national coastal cleanup. And we are eternally grateful for Christoph Haber for joining us and continuing to support us over the years. Um, we've also had support from other entities, um, including Dolphin Discovery, Ross University, and Coscab St. Kitts. And I, I don't want to make this sound like an advertisement for these companies, but we are just truly grateful for um, for them joining us and for partnering, on, partnering with us year after year. So this is another way which we um, reach out to the public to, because we also want to reach out to the private sector because um, it's not something that we government can do alone. Um, just as much push as we, the government agent entities put, put in, we need the same push from the private entities because it, it, it affects everyone, it affects all of us. And uh, this is something that we need to do to, to sensitize the public. That's what we need to do, get the private sector involved. So that is another thing that we have been doing to ensure that the wider public is reached and sensitized about the ban on plastics so that when it comes in effect, um, it won't hit them by surprise, that they're already conditioned their minds that this will happen, so they start making changes, uh, behavioral changes now. Or Jamila, would you like to add something to that, please? Well, what Solid Ways has been doing recently is doing a lot of awareness. We use our weekly radio program to make persons aware of what um, having plastic, the amount of plastics being generated to our landfill affect us. We actually go in, sometime last year we had a project where we started going into the schools to educate um, the children how plastics affect us in regards to the illegal dumping of the plastics our illegal waters are out in full force so that we can discourage persons from dumping the illegal plastics thank you very much okay um, now we'll take a very short break and come back for the final segment um, we see you shortly This is the beautiful Island Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. It is a small country with immense wonders, stunning shorelines, breathtaking landscapes, and lively lush forests. Another of its wonders is its people, a unique, vibrant, and proud culture. Here, Kittitians, Nevisians, and guests share this jewel we are all seeking to make these islands a better place to live and a haven for visitors but this little haven our home like many other beautiful places on the planet is facing a growing threat which is evident now at our doorsteps this threat is the buildup of garbage in the oceans shorelines and landfills primarily from single-use items when we use disposable plastic and styrofoam products we become responsible for this growing problem we can make a difference our community is already finding creative ways to cut down on this waste as well as raising awareness and changing mindsets we were not happy selling our organic food in styrofoam containers and plastic. So we decided to begin importing and using compostable food containers. We have reduced the waste that we produce and we hope that this serves as an example to other business, large and small. In the supermarket business, we have historically created large amounts of plastic waste. We are now encouraging our customers to refuse plastic packaging throughout 
more and more people are stepping up and bringing reusable bags. We only need to make a firm decision to start taking action. And when we all do our bit, collectively, we create huge changes. As we are learning to appreciate and enjoy our outdoor playground, we feel sad to see all the plastic bottles and styrofoam in our seas. Now that we have realized that plastics are a threat to our environment, we are becoming more conscious of our decisions. We live in an incredible place. Our islands are worth protecting. By changing our mindset and leading by example, we become more comfortable in spreading awareness to our friends, family and community of the many reasons why it is important to take good care of our environment. It's up to me. It's up to me. It's up to me. It's up to all of us. It is up to all of us to make these changes. And when more people join our efforts, we ensure a more sustainable future. The Frigate Bay Strip is going through a major transformation right now. Forget what you know about the strip in the past. When we're finished with this project, the Frigate Bay Strip will have bathrooms, gazebos, a boardwalk on the beach, enhanced visitor center, police outposts for boosted security, improved green parking, roads, sidewalk, jogging trails, enhanced landscaping, all to enhance the overall visitor experience. Our people will benefit tremendously from this and so too will our guests when tourism restarts. With an enhanced visit experience, the Frigate Bay Strip will provide new opportunities for our locals to make money when tourism eventually returns to the island. Uh, First question here is, is it necessary to put in place fees to use plastics to force change? For example, paying fees for bags in the supermarket. So we'll have, uh, Jamela, you take that one. Um, I don't think at this time it is necessary. I think that we have to work on the habit change at first. Like I mentioned earlier, about seven countries have already banned the use of single-use plastics. And Daniel did mention that it was kind of forced onto those countries and persons kind of push back. I can recall when I was in one of these countries and I was told that I had to pay 10 cents for the bag. I was like, 10 cents? <laughs> I'm going to walk with my bag the next time. So I think we can, when it comes to fees, not on that level, but at least when you have to pay for the bag, person will be more, more obligated to walk with a reusable bag. So that's an immediate implementation of a fee. However, as you travel slowly into that aspect, I think ultimately at the end when persons, when the legislation comes into effect, that persons will then ultimately have to be fine when rules are in place. Okay, thank you. And the final question here is, would there be a beach cleanup plan for this month? Uh, Diane, I think that one is, you can take that oh, one. For this month, for Plastic Free July, yeah. we do not usually do a beach cleanup during Plastic Free July because we have so many other activities taking place during the month and even if we would have considered it because of the uh, current situation in terms of our physical distancing and all of that because we usually get a large turnout um, for our beach cleanups. We had not considered having a beach cleanup for this month. However, for P Tourism Month, we will have our usual beach cleanup provided that the conditions are favorable for having a, a beach cleanup. We will have, however, quite a few other activities where people um, can get involved. And 
saying that, I just want to remind people, we do not, we, we, we support beach cleanup. So we do not necessarily have to be the ones who initiate the beach cleanup. If um, someone, some group out there is having a beach cleanup, what we do through the Heart of St. Kitts Foundation, we provide support in terms of providing gloves, cleaning equipment, or gathering um, members from our network to join that beach cleanup um, and to get the information, the data for the cleanup so that we can have um, evidence, empirical evidence of what it is we are saying with respect to the challenge that plastics present to our destination. All right, uh, that's the end of our questions, but now we want to give uh, special recognition and a thank you to our sponsors. First, Cred uh, Federal Credit Union, uh, the title sponsor of the Plastic Repurposing Competition, which you will hear more about, and the Pharmacare, as well as the Development Bank. Now, for closing remarks, uh, we will have Ms. Uh, Vicia Woods. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, for my closing remarks, I just want to encourage the public to um, reduce their use of single-use plastics um, in this um, plastic-free July. Um, this way, um, this, will this will encourage um, a behavioral change in that we will lessen our dependency on plastics when the ban in, um, does come into effect. Um, I also want us to think about the amount of plastic items that I mentioned earlier that were found on, on the beaches of the Federation. And also think about uh, the, these plastics that end up in our food chain and uh, about the carcinogenic properties that I mentioned earlier also about styrofoam containers. So I think we need to take all of these things in, into consideration and uh, really think about the necessi how necessary it is to get rid of these um, single-use plastics. All right, uh, now we'll have uh, Mr. Mello Christopher for some closing remarks. Okay, I advocate a habit change um, persons. It will really help in the decrease of plastic that is generated that comes to our landfill. Um, we ask persons to discontinue um, illegal dumping most of the time. A number of these waste end up in our marines that affect our life, our fish life. Um, we continue to educate from our offices in, uh, to children and how best to handle the disposal of uh, waste. And we are currently hoping to work on our solution, which is waste to energy. Thank you very much. Now we will have uh, Mrs. Dineal Taylor Williams. Closing remarks. Dineal. Thank you, Dr. Noreen. Um, one of the things I want to share, because I guess as you look at the composition of our panel this evening, the majority of us are from the public sector. I just want to share as someone in the tourism industry that tourists feel that the onus is on the private sector to make the industry more sustainable. And so, um, this is the case in the United Kingdom where 59% of UK travelers believe it is the industry's duty to make tourism more sustainable. And tonight I want to advocate for our private sector to get more involved in the whole campaign to reduce single-use plastics across our federation. And in going back to, in conclusion, I would like to go back to the topic where we say elimination of single-use plastics, our dream and greatest challenge. And to point out that many of the things that we have achieved in this life started with a dream. And so tonight, maybe it is time for us to wake up from the dream and take action. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, now our Final panelist, uh, Mr. Dexter Henry, also known as Judah Farai. Go ahead. Yeah, blessings. I want to give thanks still for being here and still encourage all the vendors out there still to go plastic free. Um, I believe we can do it. I believe it's a must. I believe that it's a necessity to make the change as a vendor that um, we need to go compostable. Um, as you all hear before, that plastic don't 
it won't compost. It, it, it takes many, many years to um, degrade, you know. But the compostable stuff, these things, they take like 90 days to um, be compost. So I think this is the best way to go as a vendor, and we need to set an example and hope that still the government, the community, we all work together because, as I say, it is really very hard to get rid of plastic. So we need to reorganize our mind. We need to, you know, reschedule our mind. You know, we need to really change a lot of things. Um, but first, you have to start with us and, and get everybody involved. So you know, I just encourage all the vendors still, you know, there, there is a way, there is a solution. And we have to look for it, we have to seek it, right? So let us do it. Blessings. All right, I want to thank our illustrious panel. Um, I've learned quite a bit. I'm a learner, uh, not only an educator, but I'm a learner. And tonight I've learned quite a bit. Uh, before I came in here, I thought I knew a lot about plastic pollution or pollution in general. But there's always more to learn. Uh, but we want to thank you, our listeners, and for many of you who have called in with questions. Uh, we want to thank you very much. And uh, there will be a lot more information. There is a program for the month of July, um, Plastics Free July, and uh, that you will see on the screen um, uh, at the end of this segment here. Uh, we have come to the close. And I want to thank you very much once again. Uh, have a good night. The Frigate Bay Strip is going through a major transformation right now. Forget what you know about the strip in the past. When we're finished with this project, the Frigate Bay Strip will have bathrooms, gazebos, a boardwalk on the beach, enhanced visitor center, police outposts for boosted security, improved green parking, roads, sidewalk, jogging trails, enhanced landscaping, all to enhance the overall visitor experience. Our people will benefit tremendously from this, and so too will our guests when tourism restarts. With an enhanced visit experience, the Frigate Bay Strip will provide new opportunities for our locals to make money when tourism eventually returns to the island.